The next item before you, this is on the recommendation of Mayor David J. Narkowitz. This is ordered that the City of Northampton elects to engage in the process to change health insurance benefits under Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 32B, Section 21 to 23. Is there a motion to approve? Move to approve. Is there a second? Second. Okay. So um, this was approved on first reading, um, and it now comes back to you on second reading. Um, I, uh, um, if you would like, I can give you one update as to actions I took between, since your last meeting. Um, I did, in fact, uh, reach out and schedule, in addition to doing the required notifications that we did, um, not only by certified mail, we also did hand-delivered notifications um, as well. But I also scheduled an informational meeting with all the presidents of the city um, uh, collective bargaining units um, and had a and essentially did the same presentation that I did with, with the city council at our last meeting. Um, and we had a discussion about um, my reasons for wanting to adopt this process uh, moving forward um, and you know, had a very good discussion. Um, and obviously, uh, they knew that uh, the next step for this would be for this council to take the, the final vote on it. So I did, um, I did take your advice, particularly Councilor Carney, and I thank you for that, and have reached out to them and, and had a good opportunity to, to discuss it with them. Councilor. Um, if it hasn't been done already, if you could introduce the letter that we received today from the President uh, from the Firefighters Union, uh, Michael Hatch. Got a, sent us a letter today, and I think it's it might be in the might be on our desk, and I don't know, okay. but, but just yeah. to have it introduced into the record. Certainly, um, I can. I'll make sure that we. Uh, this is a letter dated October fourth, two thousand and twelve, um, and we will add it to the record of the uh, of the proceedings. Yeah, but there's concerns here. And, yeah, and and actually, and yeah, to that point, I mean, could you address some of the the concerns that he raises? Actually, I. Uh, uh, particularly he the ones that he itemized now I'll just read the ones he itemized. okay so uh, if the intent is just to quote explore close quote other options why move through a formal process to adopt the law Two, accepting this law would nullify concessions already made by employees from all bargaining units including wage concessions and plan design changes in order to maintain our health current insurance options um, sick <laughs> by the way uh, this this uh, could further strain labor management relations and three the cost the, the deductible plans offered by the GIC would shift more cost from the health care provider to the employees and this shift in cost could limit access to care or necessitate tough choices between basic needs and proper care now I know actually point of fact you you did address at least two of these issues in initially when you were introducing this. I mean, but if you I'm could, happy to, I'm if happy you could to touch on them again, I appreciate it. Um, Thank you. In terms of the intent to explore, I think, um, I think what I, what I tried to indicate during the, um, during the meeting is that this allows us the opportunity to enter into a process uh, that does involve doing this, uh, doing this analysis that we would need to do as part of that formal process. Um, it, it would, but in it, terms of, but I, but I, but my intent is, I believe we we will need to try to uh, make changes to our plan, um, and this is the mechanism for for doing that. We, but, yeah, and, I, and I'm sorry, I, to to President Hatch's point, what he seems to suggest that that is not precluded um, by accepting this. If we accept, he he's suggesting, if I read it correctly, that you're able to research all the options regardless of whether we grant approval or not. So what do you mean to suggest? Uh, I yeah. think that's correct, except I guess what I'm saying is uh, we research the options now. We do that now as part of our right. normal process. Um, every year we try to research what the various options are. I think what I have talked about is this particular, the state has created this process so that um, when you do, when you do do that research, you then have a clear certain process with a clear time parameter around it so that you can make decisions. And again, make those decisions in the context of a process where I have, the city has to be able to offer, make a decision and offer health care uh, by May 1st for open enrollment. Um, that decision is then is, is predicated on the larger budget number that we have to have. So for example, next year, um, I'll have to present a budget to you um, in in May. I will have already had to have made a decision about the health care piece and build a budget based around that uh, to submit to you for June. Um, all of these decisions 
this this process allows us to do that in a way where there is a negotiation it's an intensified negotiation but i'm allowed to then make have a clear a clear like time parameters around that we have the negotiation and then we're allowed to move forward with a plan design if we meet certain criteria or the same goes for the GIC if we meet a certain criteria we're allowed to move forward with that so if I if I understand what you're saying correctly that you you're you're seeking more clarity in the process and allow to expedite the process which might be held up uh, through negotiations or might be uh, might constrain you in a number of ways in order to um, make your budget decision in a timely fashion. The state, the state mechanism facilitates that process for you. And and I think, on, on the other hand, that's that's the concern I'm seeing expressed here is that I, I think the language is in this suggesting um, the consequences are a little more dire than than they are. But essentially, when we get to the crux of the issue, is that you would like a more concentrated intensive process in order to work out your your budget in in a timely fashion and and have some surety and the bargaining units are concerned that they're sacrificing um uh leverage points That's and right. negotiation points and and is do i have the sense of the rub uh i i i you know the the larger that that is that is one of the issues that that has been raised and and again this is uh that is the nature that is somewhat the nature of this law it does shift the way that health care is negotiated at the municipal level and that was the intent of the law and the concern was with rising health care costs in the commonwealth um with cities and towns really wanting to be able to retain employees with with uh, flat budgets with level funding with you know all those kinds of things that having a an, a sure and easier mechanism to be able to control health care costs was a was a priority um, and so that's what the state has given us this ability and if we accept it we're allowed to do it and um, and and i and in that context the the conversation and this was discussed last time but that that this is while this is being defined as a union busting kind of action point in fact there is a rather elaborate uh, um, uh, participatory process that uh, requires buy-in from the bargaining units. It just forces a quicker timeline. But the fact is that that there, this is not ceding over total power to management to make the decision. The fact, that, but it does it does strengthen their hand. It does give it does give uh, it does give the city more leverage in that negotiation. That is, I will concede that point. But that's the that's the that's the. That was the public policy imperative in terms of controlling health care costs. I think it would be helpful if I could go on to number two. I'll answer yeah. the questions. But um, so, for example, it says accepting this law would nullify concessions already made by employees from bargaining units, including wage concessions and plan design changes um, in order to maintain our current health. This could strain labor management relations. Now, um, this was a this was a. This statement was particularly interesting coming from Local 108 because mm -hmm. they, in fact, rec rejected the plan design changes that all the other unions agreed to um, during the pr during two processes ago under the old system. So we we went through the old system. We went to the IAC. We met with the uh, the team um, from all the various unions. We put forward a proposal for plan design change. That group can vote to recommend which I think they did they recommended that we make the change but that's not a binding vote it's only it holds no authority they still have to go back to each of their individual bargaining units take votes come back I can still move forward with the plan provided I um, bargain the impact uh, the outcome of what happened in that is we now actually have two sort of two sets of health plans all the other um, bargaining units have the current health plan that we're under right now for Health New England. Local 108, because they refused to accept the plan design changes, um, are are actually we're paying a higher premium plan for them, and their members are actually paying higher premiums um, for the plan because they would not accept those uh, changes. So that's an example, I think, of the way the other the 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 current process I think um, could get bogged down. This, when we were in the PEC process, uh, that that author that group, which is has a proportional representation of all employees, actually has the power to negotiate on behalf of all the other employees, um, and so 
I, I think that that number two is instructive in terms of uh, in terms of the difference in the process and in terms of cost. Um, again, the GICP. It was interesting at the meeting that I had. A couple of the members, including a firefighter, said that they had colleagues in other communities who were on GIC plans, and they actually paid lower premiums than Northampton firefighters mm -hmm. did. So, it's uh, so, but but they. Uh, but the GIC, again, this is not making a decision to move into the GIC. It just gives us a, it gives a process whereby we can do it. We can actually move into the G, under the current law right now that was adopted in 2007, we can do it if we have the consent of 70% of the employees of the city. Um, uh, this new law uh, does, uh, allows us to have a, a slightly different process for doing that but it requires strict benchmarking about the savings, and it also has mitigation. We have to share a portion of those savings with the employees. So it's a different process, um, uh, but again, it's a lawful process. It's what's been approved by the legislature. So adopting this and going through the process does not violate any, any laws or anything. This has essentially been created as a lawful process within the Commonwealth. Uh, so I, I saw in Councilor Carney and then the next two counselors and then over here. Councilor okay, Carney. thank you. And thank you, Mayor, for actually uh, reaching out to the um, local union uh, leadership. It's so important, uh, and especially in this case, it's such a sensitive issue. Um, yeah, uh, maybe for folks at home too, this, this came out of the municipal health care reform was very contentious last year, uh, summer of 2011, yeah, down in uh, Beacon Hill and um, very stormy debates regarding this uh, was uh, finally touted as the compromise bill and um, and many things did come out of that that as the mayor described does still remain in the arena of bargaining however it is no longer traditional bargaining and you know uh, this was also touted as a necessary tool for cities and towns um, who would be completely uh, um, strung by needing to bargain collect with their unions over the uh, plan design. And I guess what concerns me here is that I'm just not fully convinced that it's something that's, that we need in Northampton right now. I'm just not convinced that uh, we need to move in this direction. I do think that um, traditional bargaining, while as the mayor mentioned, we have a two-tiered system now with Local 108 having a different premiums than everybody else in the city, you know, it was an agreement. We do have a, a final agreement that was arrived at through traditional bargaining. And um, again, I'll just say that my objections are that I'm not convinced at this point that it's, it's a law that we need to adopt here in the city. I completely understand and respect the mayor's uh, um, intentions here as those coming from trying to really uh, look at the bottom line and see what best ways we can save money. But I think that that can still happen um, within the parameters of the traditional bargaining, sitting down with each of the leaders. It may not be the GIC in the end. It may be some other plans that may, you know, the, but Ultimately, uh, what we do when we adopt this is we do diminish the collective bargaining rights of our city employees, and I'm very uncomfortable with that at this point, and so I, I'll remain with my objections respectfully. Thank you. Okay. Um, Councilor Freeman Daniels. I have a financial interest in this matter and uh, would ordinarily be have to disqualify myself from, uh, from even discussing this without disclosing it. So. Uh, I think I, I have to uh, disqualify myself except for the fact that by my knowledge this would eliminate, if, if ever all the other counselors did as well who had financial conflicts, this would disqualify us for a, a quorum. So I'm going to invoke the rule of necessity. I, I just I want to point out to you that the Ethics Commission meeting we had said that we only it, it, this only has to happen once. You can do it again. It's fine. But we, yeah. So let me just okay. expound a little bit further. Um, I... Uh, I have to have health insurance. Uh, it's it's the law of the state, so uh, I have to get it from um, my employer who uh, does not offer it. Uh, and um, I don't know. Uh, I'm willing to say it on on public TV. I'm, I'm very wealthy. I'm a very wealthy individual. Um, I'm actually probably 
the wealthiest individual in Northampton. Um, I, other than perhaps uh, Councilor Dwight, because I, I actually I, I have more Facebook friends than he does. Uh, so, uh, or actually, you have more than I do. I have probably. way more. So, um, my my wealth is 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 vast, and uh, to me, the uh, the issue of counselors having health insurance is uh, mostly uh, a, a fact that we don't have uh, single payer health insurance in this country or or uh, universal coverage in the state. So you have to have it from an employer. Uh, my employer doesn't offer it. Um, so this is a fringe benefit offered through the city, so I'm, I'm taking advantage of it. Uh, I might also point out that um, even if you factor in the benefits that the city gives me, uh, it's actually much less than the um, figure of $5,000 that was adopted for the council in 1986, adjusted for inflation. Uh, I, I'm actually getting paid less than the councilors were in 1986 after you adjust for inflation. And uh, so I, I'm not ashamed of myself for taking the city's health insurance. And uh, I actually uh, applaud the city for, uh, uh, for offering pe people of, of my enormous wealth uh, a chance to uh, have health insurance. Thank you. Uh, Councilor, uh, Councilor Schwartz and then Councilor LaBarge, then Councilor Adams. Um, so I want to say um, at the last meeting, I um, spoke in very strong support of this, and I almost want to apologize because it was prior to my full comprehension, which happened at the, by the very end of the meeting, when I did realize at the, at the end of the day, what I do, I do um, agree with Councillor Carney in needing to call out that it is, um, it is a significant shift in the balance of power between labor and management. And, at the end of the day, while Councillor Dwight, you were talking about there's there is bargaining, and you know, at the end of the day, it is the decision making is a unilateral. The power of the decision making is a unilateral one, um, with the constraints that Mayor Arkowitz outlined around the um, the 25 percent uh, has to benefit to the employers. There are constraints, but in the end, the decision making the the decision making is uh, is in the hands of management and. And and it was really the light bulb went on the end. Went, oh, oh, okay. This this you know we're not talking about a level playing field at all, um, and we are talking about the larger issue of, I mean, union busting doesn't that term doesn't work in this community, thank goodness, um, but it it is it's on the edge of well, it is it's a sh it's a shifting of of power, and um, and negotiating strength, and so I'm deeply concerned about that, and I'm and I'm. Really concerned because I do believe that it's part and parcel of this, um, of going, bringing us to the lowest common denominator to try to make ends meet, and that, and we are we are pushed to the wall with uh, this desperate, with where we're we're faced with this devil's choice uh, between, uh, you know, teachers in the school or uh, health insurance for the teachers, um, and it's a wrong choice, and we need to reframe the debate fundamentally, and it is about where are our revenues coming from, how are we solving this fiscal crisis, and this isn't the appropriate route, and whether or not we, there are issues with the negotiating that are, that are outside of the fiscal constraints, let's, let's have at them, but this is a response fundamentally driven by our fiscal crisis, and it is, I think, a wrong solution um, in the perfect world. So having said that, here we are in the imperfect world, um, filled with the here and now, filled with these terrible choices, and one, I have a very practical question that will help me sort this out, which is, can you restate, Mayor Narquist, who was, 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 was every union represented at the meeting that you had, that you held in between these two meetings? Uh, I invited everyone. Um, who, who which one? Uh, so the um, president of, the, um, of NACE, the North uh, Hampton. Government uh, employees. Nate, did you say school Nate? employees. Uh, oh. I'm sorry, uh, the, Sharon that? Carlson, who's the president of, of all of our education. Educational. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm blanking on the acronym. Six. Um, what's six. There's six. There's six different bargaining units that she represents. Um, um, Mr. Hatch, Michael Hatch, Firefighter Hatch, uh, who um, represents Local 108, and actually one of his board members also came. Um, the representative, the president of AFSME um, was there. The president of NAPIA was there. Um, is that the police? Uh, NAPI is professional employees. employees. Oh, okay. um, so that would be uh, man mid level managers and some of the de department heads. Um, and then um, 
we had someone from Forbes Library who was there as well. Was police there? Uh, police did not did not send a representative. Uh, they did not send a representative, but they were all you know noticed, and we noticed. Uh, so I can't help but take note of this. I mean, I I do believe I I don't know I don't know what to how to interpret the um, we we got the communication from Mr. Hatch, and we haven't heard anything from others, and I don't want to assume. I don't know. I, I I don't know whether from this meeting, you know, there was this meeting, there was this conversation, there was a dialogue, and is the fact that we're not that they that we didn't hear from most of them, and that they didn't attend tonight. Although t attending tonight is is parenthetical because they might not have been able to make it, but they could have communicated other ways. And I'm not sure whether they're saying okay. Um, and I, mean, I I will tell you, I was very clear with them that you know. I this decision ultimately was in the city council and that they should and could communicate with the city council mm -hmm. on issues that they wanted to raise with you. So, uh, and again, they've received now three different notices about it um, since the prior to my introducing it, um, certified mail and in one case hand delivered, so, which is part of the regulation. So I, I, um, I've done what I can do yeah, I to try to that. be proactive. And, and the last thing I want to say, because I want to hear from other counselors, is that is that I, I totally respect and um, and really un understand, really could see it as your duty that you are bringing this forward to us, in that in that it is your charge to to um, use what is available to make sure we stay fiscally sound and maintain our basic services and our jobs. And I appreciate the position that you're in in doing this. And again, my objection is on a much larger level. Um, and, and if I do end up objecting, it's going to be on that larger level that this is not where the solutions lie. I am taking comfort wherever we end, if we do end up with this, that, that we have not had a hue and cry from labor and maybe because they trust our community too and, and they trust the processes that are laid out but i'm deeply concerned that this is where we have to get to so i'll stop here thank you very much councillor labarge i have to agree with councillor carney a hundred percent on what she's saying here mayor maybe you can explain why do we have to go through this process why do we actually have to go through this process of you being able to talk to a GIC? I, I just don't get it. You keep saying, yes, it's a general law and so forth. You just can't call GIC, make an appointment and have them come here. Why, why are we doing this? I'm not talking, it's, it's not about talking with the GIC. It's, it's more about a process. Um, uh, uh, the the GIC is offered to all state employees. I understand you, that. You understand that, and and so and they've recently opened it up to municipalities, and now they've created this mechanism for going to the GIC or making plan design changes. And I, I will I will sort of echo what Councillor Schwartz said. I do believe it is my duty as the chief executive officer of the city, knowing the the financial situation that we face on an annual basis, knowing the health care costs that we face particularly, um, I believe it's, it, it's my duty to bring this forward to the City Council for its adoption. Um, I, 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 again, it's, you know, I've, I've gone through, you know, we went through one budget process, we were facing a 12 percent increase. Um, we, I attempted to work through that process to try to find savings. Um, you know, we did have a plan that would have yielded significant savings. Um, and. Um, it was ultimately uh, voted down um, by that the, under the current system, at least the recommendation was that we shouldn't move to that system. Now I could have moved to that system um, and then tried to do individual bargaining around it. But again, the time constraint that, I, that we're under and as well as the financial constraint, it, uh, I think that's just as evidence of the system that we have right now. And I believe that this is an important tool for the municipalities to have to be able to mm -hmm. deal with health care costs. So I'm, I'm just concerned about the unions in general, mm -hmm. the total communication, how far are we with it? I've heard you say how you've had these meetings and so forth. Why would we be getting a letter from Mr. Hatch? I, I, should I'm, I called your office today, Mayor, and I did talk with Len in regards of the email that was sent to us from Mary Medora, and then I needed to get some verification 
on some of the language that Consular at Large Bill Dwight talked about today, I mean tonight at our meeting. I also talked with Susan Wright. She had not seen this either, and it was very confusing here on some of this language. Mm -hmm. You know, so I had not heard back from anybody of giving me some of the verification of, of the language on here. Well, this was, so. if I can just respond to that, um, I, mean, I, I believe that I have, I have tried to have very good communications with all of our bargaining units when I, since I've come into office. I have um, settled all of our, well, I've settled most of our contracts with all of our units through this fiscal year. I've figured out a way, I believe, to give modest raises, to be able to give step increases as part of that process. I will say with Local 108, um, we haven't had a contract for several years. We don't have a contract and haven't had a contract for several years. We're involved in some, some um, uh, several multi issues on multiple fronts. We're in arbitration, we're in litigation. Um, mediation, pickination, we're in every, you know, pick any age that we're in, and, um, and, uh, and we are, so there's been some conflict with Local 108, and that, that has extended to the health care issue as well. So I don't really believe that that, that I don't think that's representative of, of the relationship that I've developed with all the bargaining units, and I do want to continue to work with them, and I do want to continue uh, to try to make sure that we can retain our employees and not lay them off. But I can tell you that if, if we come to next year um, and we're facing a 10% increase in health insurance and we're going to get level funded by the city, by the state again, you know, that's a that's million dollars I have to cut immediately from our budget. And as you all well know, most of that is employees. And so we'll have to lay off employees. So I believe this gives me the ability to make uh, reasonable changes in it is part of a negotiation but it gives me the ability to do it in with much more surety clarity and and you and frankly using you know we get part of this the impetus partly for this was state government was giving increasingly more and more of its state aid was going to health care costs at the municipal level they've made changes at the state level they have a you know state GIC plan that's allowed them to contain their health care costs so part of it is they're actually wanting to see this at the municipal level as well so uh, so also, that's, the, that's that's one background also too i mean you're talking about GIC there're several policies through GIC it's just not the state GIC they have several others that you can get connected to. Plus the fact is, this is where I need some language here. If this is approved tonight, this will give you the okay to go ahead and talk with GIC or whatever, okay? But they are going to have to prove to you as the mayor, okay, of what they're going to demonstrate percentage-wise, correct, with the health insurance? Yes. What, what, what the next step would be is we would have to develop a proposal um, to, come, to bring to the Insurance Advisory Committee, which is uh, the right. current standing right. committee. So we, will, um, uh, we, we, we work with a health care consulting firm. We actually just made a change in our health care consulting firm. Uh, we had been using a firm for many years. I decided to go out to bid for those services, and we've just retained a new firm. So that firm will be tasked with um, uh, doing, the, uh, doing the analysis like we do every year um, uh, and looking at GIC, looking at all the various plans that are out there. We can only use plans that are approved by the state, including the state plans. That's right. And, so, and then we have to develop a proposal. Now, this new system, uh, also says we not only have to develop a proposal, but we have to show what the savings might be. We have to show um, how we would uh, share up to 25% of those savings with employees. So what that sometimes plays out in other communities. Um, sometimes they set up health care savings accounts for employees with those savings. Sometimes they do a holiday on premiums. They, you know, one month there's no premium as a way to pass the savings. So we'd have to develop all of that and bring it to this meeting, um, and then that would begin this process. So okay, that, what, that's the way the process works. Thank you for explaining that. The Actually, what bothered me with this letter is when um, the president of the union came out to state that Mayor Narkowitz has stated that adopting the Mass General Law 32B is just the first step in achieving cost-effective health care. 
this is where we disagree. And you've had a meeting with them, you just told us, so they're still disagreeing. Once this law is adopted locally, moving to the GIC is almost certain. It, it really isn't. It, it really, it's not automatic and it's not, and again, I, I don't, I, that's not, my intent in this is not to move into the GIC, but I'm certainly going to look at it. Right. And, if, and if we find, I mean, I talked about before the strict deadline. So if, it, to go into the GIC for July 1st of next year, I have, we have to notify them by December 1st of that's this right. year. So it's a very tight deadline. So I, I have, as I've said before, you're, you are just voting the first step in the process. You're not voting on whether to go into GIC or not, or whether to change yeah, plans. No, give you the authority. It, it to gives go. us the it gives us the ability to then work through that whole process. And I gave you that flow chart right. from MMA, I which saw kind it. of shows you that. So, thank you, Mayor. Um, Councilor Adams. First, I want to, want to address the suggestion that the, that the, the health insurance benefits that we get are somehow a secret. They're not new, and they're not a secret. Uh, counselor, well, we've been counselors have been eligible have have been offered this opportunity since 1977, and. Um, we've been getting a stipend of, as Councillor Freeman Daniel said, since uh, 5,000 since 1986. And I remember a few days after I was um, sworn in, January of 2010, um, I didn't know there were any benefits, and I didn't and and I didn't know that this until Human Resources called me and asked me to come in so they can tell me about benefits. And I sat down with Joanne Legrant, and I know they re reached out to other counselors too because I was there with Councillor Tacy. So Councillor Tacy and I sat down with Joanne Legrant. And Joanne LeGrant went over Councillor Tacy and I, uh, all the benefits. She told us all about the health benefits, so we certainly knew about them. It wasn't a secret to us. And um, I imagine, because they called me, they did the same thing to the other counselors. So I think they did a good, good, did a good job of reaching out, at least to me and Councillor Tacy, because we were there. And um, <laughs> He said you didn't, you and, didn't know you And so further, I think that, <clears throat> I think that given the fact that with the information Councillor Freeman Daniels gave us, I don't think it's unreasonable to take the $5,000 stipend, which I'm thankful to have, and also get health insurance benefits. I was an elected Forbes Library trustee uh, with no stipend and no benefits, and I was happy to do that, and I'm happy to serve here for the small stipend we get. But I don't think health insurance benefits are unreasonable on top of it. Um, <clears throat> with respect to the person who spoke and suggested that we were some of the wealthiest people in the city. I'm not sure how she knows that. I mean, I now know that Councilor Freeman is the wealthiest person in the city. But before that, I didn't know how wealthy or unwealthy any of my fellows here were. But um, I don't think we're much more wealthy getting $5,000 a year as a stipend. With respect to the underlying issue, <clears throat> I, I respect completely what the mayor's doing here. I respect uh, the honorable mayor's job performance in general. However, <clears throat> I have to agree with the well-articulated points of the learned counselor from Ward 1, and I have to agree with her in voting no. Thank you. Uh, point of order? Uh, uh, I just uh, want us to be careful, Mayor, that we stick to the issue at hand, because I think the, the issue of whether members of the city council or the school committee or the elected officials, whether they derive health benefits is not germane to this particular issue as it's presented. And uh, I just don't want us to confuse the matter or confuse the public. I, re I'm, I respect Councillor Adams' uh, reasoning and Councillor Freeman Daniels, but I would respectfully ask that we stick to the issue that is on the floor, mm -hmm. which is adopting the yes. state law okay. as presented. So, so if I could just um, get back. Councillor Murphy had his hand up, then Councillor Specter, then Councillor Tacy, then Councillor Dwight. Or I may have got, it may actually be Murphy. Uh, That's okay. Tacey. I'll, I'll wait. <laughs> Point of order, Robert's rule says if you spoke on it once, yeah. everybody, you don't speak oh, yeah. on it a second time until somebody else. Right. Councillor Murphy. Go ahead, mm -hmm. David. You know, it, it does appear that all the players in this little insurance drama are all victims of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and its infinite wisdom and the way it dealt with this issue. I mean, they recognized the fact that the managers of municipal government needed more flexibility in dealing with the expensive issue of health care. And then they came up with this cockamamie approach to do it, which I don't think makes me as an elected city councilor responsible to the taxpayers to efficiently run the city happy. It doesn't make the mayor happy. It doesn't make the unions happy. But it's the one tool the Commonwealth chose to give to us. And I don't see how we cannot exercise that tool. We didn't design it, but it's the only tool we have. I, I don't like it. The mayor doesn't like it. The unions don't like it. But it's what they gave us. And if you look at any source of revenue we have, 
try explaining the property taxes to people. I did that for years. The Commonwealth set it up. We have to abide by it. The meals tax, the room, you know, the, ho the hotel tax, the meals tax. It's all crazy. We're not really an economically viable entity. I'm sure the Commonwealth knows that, and they use, they use state aid to keep us all in line. There's no one in this discussion that isn't a victim of the Commonwealth. But if any of you know how we can get the Commonwealth to change its behavior and respect its 351 municipalities as equal partners in government, from what I can tell, we deliver more direct services to the citizens of the Commonwealth than they do. God bless them. I just wish they'd get helpful. I just wish they'd respect us as an equal partner in government and let us deal honorably in some of these things rather than with these bizarre solutions they send to us that might be politically expedient for themselves, but it certainly doesn't work for us at the local level. Uh, I'm prepared to support the mayor in responsible using the one tool he's been given. Do I like the tool? No. Well, we only got one tool and we got a big problem. They recognize the problem, but they didn't give us a very good solution. Yeah. So, Councillor Spector and then Councillor Tacey. Councillor Tacey. Oh, I'm sorry, Councillor Tacey. I'm sorry, Councillor Tacey. Sorry. <laughs> Too many. Uh, go ahead, sir. No, go ahead, Councillor Tacey, then Councillor Spector. Uh, well, um, also, uh, having heard from the wealthiest man in the city and alluding to the second wealthiest, um, we will. Uh, I, it's all about saving money. We, we flirted with cresting $10 million worth of health insurance for years. It was close a couple of times, and once it went up above, and then all of a sudden didn't charge us, didn't go quite so much, so it went down below $10 million. Now it's above $10 million. So it's all about saving money. So it is all in the same, it is all in the same big picture here. We're trying to save some money somehow. And uh, it is the only tool, and I was, thank Councilor Murphy for saying it is the only tool that we have, or one of the only tools that we have to do, to do this with. The, the state says you have to have insurance, and your full-time employer does not provide it. So, uh, but a part-time employer does. But maybe we need to look at uh, how we even pass out our own health insurance. Maybe we should look at part-time employees uh, as though a regular uh, employer does not um, does not provide. Well, point of order, Mr. Uh, Chairman. I, I, I've asked. I think this is. I I'll, I'll I, say I, point of order. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Uh, just I just asked for a ruling on the point of order that I brought up earlier. Uh, well, certainly, the issue of of individual employees receiving health insurance is really not germane to this particular issue that we're debating, which is the issue of do we accept my point of order? Mass general business. Uh, so, but I, I just wanted. To I'd like to say something. Point of order. Well, actually, I, I want to give Councillor Tacey an opportunity to finish yeah. his statement yeah. if statement. he has other information that he wants to provide. I mean, we talk about we're talking about desperate and fiscal crisis, fiscal well-being, mm -hmm. maintaining basic services and jobs. This is all part of this discussion. Mm -hmm. All part of trying to do something to save money. And I was going to offer a proposal that maybe save the city some money and maybe save some of these jobs. Next year, our health insurance is going to go up again. It goes up every single year. So to put the discussion off and just brush it to the side and every time we point try to order. discuss something. Mr. Chairman, point of order. This is not on, here's, here's the point of order and I want to speak. I think this is a very important issue. Therefore, members of the public, the reason we have an agenda is so that people know when an issue is coming forward. It's part of the whole um, way that we have a meeting. This is, I'm not trying to brush this under. I'm trying to say this should be something that is ref that comes to the city council. It perhaps should be referred by a number of committees. It is not germane to this particular issue. I don't, I think we should, I'm not putting it off. I think it should go on the agenda as soon as possible. I think it's a broader issue. It needs to be on the agenda. It's a full discussion in itself, but it's not a discussion here. We could talk about 400 different ways of saving money. All of those should be discussed. Just because it's part of, of health care does not make it germane to this particular issue, and that's my point of order. Uh, I guess, I guess my, my regret is that two other counselors have, ex have expounded on this issue during this debate um, of counselors having health care. So I, I feel that it's... Can I make uh, a suggestion on... Can I make a, it's very germane. Can I make a suggestion as to procedure? Uh, go ahead. If there's a point of order, if I'm correct in Robert's rules, if, if it's requested, you make a ruling. The mayor makes... The chair makes the no. ruling. And, and then it can be appealed to the full council who can vote yes or no on the mayor's ruling by majority rule. So okay. maybe we should 
do that, that's the process and that's democratic. So I guess yes. I'll, let me let me issue a final ruling. Uh, my ruling is I believe Councillor Tacey has the right to offer information in the debate that he feels is germane to this issue, mm -hmm. as other councillors have. I will say, though, that if it comes to the point of offering proposals on things that are, that, that are not really ad adaptable to this particular chapter of state law, that that, that that would be better suited to be brought up in a separate Another. meeting, noticed, et cetera. But in uh, terms of, I, I believe, if, so that would be my ruling. If point, you want to make a comment. Point of information. Mm -hmm. Just to clear this up, on uh, Section 11 and the charter that we're about to vote on, uh, uh, Article 10, within 180 days after the passage of this act, the City Council shall enact an ordinance establishing an elected official compensation advisory board. Said ordinance shall contain provisions that the board shall periodically, but no less frequently than 10 years, study the adequacy and equity of the compensation benefits and expense allowed allowances of municipal elected officials and report its finding and recommendations to the mayor and the city council and said report shall be filed with the city clerk and said ordinance shall further specify the composition, term of office and method of appointment of the members of said board and any other provisions deemed appropriate by the city council. This will be discussed when the charter is, when if. or if the charter is passed. This is actually conditional on the charter, a review of the compensation the council has currently receiving and will receive in the future, it will take it out of the political realm and put it in a public commission's oversight. I think, if I may, that should put a rest to that portion of this discussion and go back to the discussion, the more relevant and germane aspects of the discussion that we are getting lost, to be honest. In, so, in this. I, so, so I've ruled at the point of order that I, I believe that Councillor Teishi should be able to finish his statement uh, I do not believe it would be appropriate for him to make a, a proposal or, or talk about something that really hasn't been noticed, et cetera, but I believe he should, he can finish his statement. That's my rule. Unless there's an, unless and, just, oh, someone, so, can someone can object to the, the council can appeal and then it goes to the full council for a vote on, on the totally chair's correct. decision. If, if, they, if, totally you, if they're correct. under your rules, you are, that is totally correct. So I make, that's my ruling. Um, and it stands. Okay. So, uh, so, Councillor, if you want to proceed. My point, my point is all about money. It's all about saving money. And whatever we can do to save money, if that is a tool that we have, that is what we will go with. And I do believe this is on the agenda. The insurance is on the agenda. Uh, but and not the topic. This is the topic of accepting a state right. law, Section 2123. Uh, I intend to support it. We're not talking about the, the other issue that you're talking about in terms of a specific proposal that can be debated and voted on tonight. I intend to support it. But I also don't think that anything should be stifled on, on the tension that maybe a vote may pass or may not, and maybe we will get this in. It never happens. I mean, everything is discussed long before votes are taken, and I wouldn't want to rest on the charter passing or failing. Okay. And maybe the discussion can happen at any time, even before the charter is even voted on. It, that is certainly can it just uh, under our open meeting law we have to let the public know that we're going to have that discussion and give them proper notice the vote of the charter i don't think is even doesn't even play into this mm -hmm. okay. well, absolutely does not play into it yes it does okay. um, uh, it's right in there oh yeah he, he was, next. Yeah. Yeah. was next in line so bigger uh, my big yeah, go ahead. um on the, on the issue we were talking about i just want to say i i actually agree with both councillor murphy simultaneously with Councillor Schwartz and the Councillor from Ward 1. Uh, and it's kind of what you were saying. I think everybody's right here. Uh, I think the, on a theoretical level, if it's just theory, I actually would vote against this tonight. Yeah. And part of the reason I'm going to vote yes, and I think part of the reason, my guess is, part of the reason why we don't see a lot more opposition from people coming forward is because of the specific mayor we have right now. And I've worked with him for a long time, and I think his fairness in dealing with all parties is pretty well known. What concerns me is I don't think he's going to be mayor forever. He will be, but I don't think he, I I don't think he will be. And so the, the long term does concern me, because I think it is very much the problem with a law like this, when you put it in, when you give the administrators more power, then it's the individual administrators that can be good or bad. So one of the questions would be, well, if, if and when you decide not to be mayor or run anymore, how easy is it then we could come back and change this, correct? So uh, I just want to say I'm, I'm, 
in the middle on voting for this, I believe I will vote yes, um, especially given the uh, reasoning of Councillor Murphy, but uh, I, I do have qualms. Can we move the question? Can, can I put you in the unfair position in the absence of any representation speaking to the otherwise and the 11th hour letter from the president and the firefighters? What was your sense of the meeting? What did you did you get? A, were objections actually raised that you did not satisfy or? Uh, I, I think I mean, we had a uh, discussion mainly about the, the differences in the process. The, there was a discussion regarding um, the the weighted vote in the PEC, um, uh, which is weighted to the number of employees. So um, Sharon uh, Carlson, who's right. the president of NACE, said that you know she would have a, a sort of a veto type vote on the committee just because she the sheer number. Of she represents employees. the largest bargaining um, units. Again, I, I, I mean, I, I would say that even under the current process, that that veto exists because they're the largest block of employees That's and so if we um, cannot reach uh, agreement on health care with them then it's going to affect our costs and it's going to and so it's uh, I really don't see that as a as a major stumbling block plus we talked about that there knew are, are other those other employees are represented at the table there's a give and take and I said you know, there's also an aspect of that. you will have to work together as a group it. to come up with what you believe is the best um, outcome or the best plan option for the rest of the employees that you're elected to represent. Um, so that, that, that was one aspect of it. Again, I mentioned that several employees, um, uh, the Napier representative said that they were, they were, you know, they appreciated the, 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 um, interest in, in trying to do some analysis. And, you know, they, I think they had a spouse that worked was in the GIC. So they'd had some experience with the GIC that was, so they had some experience in that. And I mentioned the other firefighter who had a colleague who was in the GIC. Um, and, and so there wasn't, there, there wasn't, um, you know, it was not a contentious meeting. It was really my giving, laying out my reasons. I think that there was, you know, discussion about the concerns about cost shifting and about um, uh, whether or not, um, you know, say, you know, this would affect compensation discussions, and et cetera, those kinds of things. Um, but again, it was it was an informational meeting. Everyone was very respectful, and and um, you know, we that's that's how we. We left the meeting. Well, I, I would say, actually, it's, I think it's significant the absence of representation objecting. Um, I'm not going to assume assent on their part, but I'm certainly not going to. I, I can't presume that they're all sick or distracted in some other way and didn't see this coming for for some time. And particularly, you know, uh, uh, a president of any bargaining unit is going to be damn sure to make as as uh, President Carlson was the last meeting to be here ASAP and emphatically state their case at the time, which actually precipitated the conversation we're having now. Their absence tonight actually speaks louder in many respects to me. I'm per, I'm, I, mean, I, I think there's the, dil, the due diligence is being done presented by the mayor given the, the lousy circumstances that we all agree. But the fact is, is that, that I, I'm going to presume in the absence of dissent, and actually, and I think President uh, Hatch's dissent um, was muddled, I'll say, and um, in, not necessarily as cogent as I would think that it, it should be in order to, to at least generate enough uh, objection for me. I think the, because we bear a responsibility now, this is the one point, and this is, of course, my also added frustration, this is the one point that actually we as the elected representatives get to weigh in, yay or nay, this is it. And the fact that that burden is on us, that the burden is consequently on the representative units to make their case known and make it known to us. And, and certainly, you know, President Hatch's letter came, I think, uh, three hours ago or four hours ago, how long, long it was. I, I'm going to, I'm really actually going to um, comfort myself in some small way by thinking that that it is, this is not the line in the sand that they're prepared to draw as far as bargaining uh, leverage. And I, I don't want to, I at the same time have, have been generally repulsed by any diminution of, of, of collective bargaining strength and, and, and strategy, but at the same time recognizing that we have a fiduciary responsibility as the elected officials for the people who are actually subsidizing this. And in the absence of overt 
expression of objections in the presence of a, of a looming issue as, as Council Schwartz laid out and as Council Murphy also laid out to, to, to suggest that we defer our responsibility in that respect, I, I would feel that I would actually not be doing what I was elected to do. So I will actually be voting yes. I think as many councilors who will be voting yes with a, a bad taste in my mouth that is not reflecting the mayor's diligence. It is actually more to Council Murphy's point that we are daily asked to make really absurd de decisions based on an absurd construct that gets more and more absurd all the time. And it's a frustration we speak of, and this is the larger issue that Councilor Schwartz is talking about, is what we speak of. It's not just, it's, it doesn't emanate from this town. It, eman it, it comes from without. It comes from the state. It comes from the federal government. It comes from the choices that we make as a, as a country uh, collectively. And we've, we've bought into this really cynical plan and design that we keep being told we're giving tax cuts from point in fact, actually, we're just finding other sneaky ways to subsidize these things. And then we're the ones on the ground who have to make the decision for the really stupid antic processes that we're left with. But the, the thing that's most critically important is the fact, as Council Tacey pointed out, these are mounting costs, and at the time that these these insurance was originally given, it was actually given as as a way, as a dodge for um, um, management or the CEO to couldn't come up with the money to provide salaries, so there was a cheaper way to provide insurance. The insurance was a bargain at that time, once upon a time, and that was you know we can give you insurance, we can't give you a pay raise, but we can give you insurance that will cover your health care costs further on down the line. Now, health healthcare costs universally throughout the country actually inform every, almost every fight that we have, and the most cynical fights that we're having as well, but they create the biggest financial crisis that we're dealing with. And this is where the rubber hits the road. I, I can't in good conscience uh, deny the mayor the opportunity to at least expedite the process. I think that actually the way the Commonwealth has structured it, there's so many bites of the apple here and so many opportunities and so many requirements, particularly the impact requirements, that there is protections built into the system that I, that I would hope and assume that some of the bargaining units recognize. So I, 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 all said and done, yeah, I'll vote yes. Um, if I could just, uh, there was only one other, th I forgot to mention one other thing that, that did transpire at the meeting, and that was there was an agree there was, there was agreement by, I put it out there, they agree that the, the overall health care system is broken and that we spend too much time in rooms like that well, dealing with find a sentient per so, person who would argue exactly. about the so, opposite. So there, what we, there was common total agreement on that. I think Councillor Freeman Daniels and then Councillor Carney and then Councillor Murphy. Uh, so there's not much new I can say. I also, I, like I said last time, if I were a member of a union or a union president, I certainly wouldn't feel very comfortable with this. Uh, and I do think that uh, we've heard from two significant unions, uh, union representation, uh, the president of the firefighters, the president of, of the educational uh, union. So uh, I, I do think that uh, this is generally something that uh, hurts a union bargaining uh, right uh, ability. And um, I have to remind myself, number one, that, uh, you know, we, I have an obligation, uh, as, as all the rest of the counselors do, to the taxpayers of, of Northampton and to the people that we provide services to, whether or not they pay taxes. Uh, and also um, that, uh, that health insurance costs have been spiraling out of control and they're very, they're very difficult to control. So this is, the best, this is the best tool that the state has given us so far. And we've seen the evidence from over 100 other towns in Massachusetts, they've saved millions of dollars. And um, finally, that uh, the, the last piece is there is, um, it, it, it isn't as though, uh, the, the mayor will be able to go directly into the GIC uh, and so on. And, and it really isn't as though the GIC is really a bad thing because uh, the uh, GIC is what the state employees get. Uh, it's a level of care that the state feels comfortable providing its employees. So uh, it's, a, it's a decent level of, of, um, of insurance and uh, so I'm, I'm comfortable voting aye. Councilor Murphy. You know, the one thing that would be guaranteed from this if we vote for it is the fact that we'll have a level playing field. When this process is done, 
all the members of the bargaining units and all the unrepresented people, for that fact, that get health care will be getting the same thing. It will create a level playing field and even environment. If that is accomplished, there's nothing that stops our 13 bargaining units from bargaining anything else they want to bargain to, in their opinion, level their playing field. They can go back and negotiate any of the other items that they want to negotiate with the city. The plan will be done. Everyone will have the same insurance. But if there's something important to the police or the firefighters or the teachers or the NAPIA people, they can negotiate anything else they want if they feel that that's a process that will, again, level the playing field for them. And those are things that this law does not, you know, give the mayor a process on. He's still got to negotiate anything they want to negotiate with him. So it might take health care and make it a, a level playing field for everybody and take plan design away from each bargaining unit. But it doesn't take away from them anything else they choose to bargain. And it might be one thing for one group and something for another group. So right. while, it, while, while this make, might make health care uh, more efficient for the mayor to handle, it's, it's really not going to affect the rest of bargaining, I assume. Am I correct in that? Uh, Being a sure, uh, as, as our resident well, expert, resident such labor expert. <laughs> um, and through the chair, I actually uh, I found very interesting uh, Councillor Murphy's uh, argument about the level playing field. It, it looks like it. I mean, it to say that we're taking we're taking this aspect, this uh, traditional bargaining over plan design, away from everybody, then levels the playing field. That that is an interesting uh, point, and so. Um, However, I, I disagree that taking it away from everybody makes it somehow better. <laughs> but it is really interesting. Um, one thing I do want to say is, I, you know, what makes us, we brought a lot of personalities into, into this argument, which is unfortunate because what, we're, what we do when we pass this law legislation is we are passing this for future administrations. I have every confidence that Mayor Narkowitz could sit down, even in a traditional bargaining setting, and work these things out and be able to, uh, as has been done in the past with previous mayors, and as he's shown so far in being able to come to resolution on a number of collective bargaining agreements, um, come to terms and come to uh, uh, agreeable terms around wages, benefits, plan design, all of those things. I'm less confident because I, of an unknown, of a, of a future mayor and of future councils and of future local union presidents, for that matter. So in, in some ways, that's why I'm less comfortable with making, really, as Councillor Schwartz pointed out, it's much more about the fundamental shift in balance. We would all be hearing very loudly and clearly if this were in the reverse, if actually the legislation were such that from now on, collective uh, uh, local unions, municipal unions may make the final decision on all matters of plan design. I think everybody, is, you know, that would really shake things up. But you know, in fact, it's not that. It's that the mayor um, can make that decision. And right now, I'm just not sure that it's necessary. That's that was my own thing. I haven't been convinced that we can't come to a resolution in our traditional forms of bargaining that we've had up to this point. And that was, you know, fundamentally my argument and my objection, respectfully, because I have utmost confidence that this mayor would be able to achieve those uh, agreements amicably. Uh, Councillor Schwartz. <clears throat> just want to say that I respect my colleagues' um, dilemma and, struggle and outcome. Um, and um, decision to support it. I, I do believe I, um, I think I object to the premise, Councilor Murphy, of um, it's the only tool, so we need to use it. I actually think that if it's a, if we think it's a failed tool, then um, I'm not convinced, therefore we should use it. Although I understand why we might be. I mean, so again, I really respect the moment that we're in, and I really want to say that, um, it is, it's, it's a reflection of, uh, of our times and of the battle that lies ahead and, of the, and where we need to put our energy. And I would really love to see joining forces across the community, across counselors to unions um, and, the, the, and all of the various constituencies to come together to make the changes in the Commonwealth that I feel like you've given up on them, uh, the, the, those changes being possible. And I want to say, 
I haven't and we can't. And that the advocacy for real tax reform that gets us the revenues from people who can afford to pay, that where we're not then having to turn to this recourse. I, I do want to say that's where we need to put our energies in the future, p following this vote, uh, whatever its outcome. And I look forward to participating in that because um, I, I do feel like this is emblematic of, um, of going to the, like I said before, the lowest common denominator where we can, and I want to raise the level of debate and raise our definition of success and solving this problem. Uh, Councilor Barge and then Councilor Dwight. Um, I'm going to support this because I feel that we are just authorizing you, Mayor, to go ahead and be able to talk with whoever you have to talk with. And I also believe you as a mayor will work with all the unions throughout the municipality without a problem. So I, don't, I didn't see any unions here tonight, and that bothers me except for this one letter. So I think if there was such an outcry, they would have been here standing in line speaking in front of that microphone. So, and no matter if we get another mayor someday, we've had, I've had, this is my third one now, and I've seen changes, and we've never gone under as a city, never gone under financially as a city. So I think we're in good hands, and I think if the mayor should ever leave, it will follow. Thank you. Councillor Tacey. Can I move the question? Yeah. Sorry. Uh, sorry. Some other folks didn't sorry. want to speak, oh. but if you want to. I didn't see any. Uh, one more hand, and then. then. I, I actually. I, I, I do want to, I, I, the part of the frustration, and I, this is to Councilor Carney's point about the personalities, and it's true. I mean, we, we, make, we make laws and rules that are not for personalities or for existing personalities. We make it for, we, we codify something that, that are tools to be used by whoever is officiating. The thing is, is that, you know, we're doing double duty tonight. Uh, Council Carney is speaking for the unions. And we're debating for the unions, and we're negotiating for the unions in the absence of union conversation and participation. Now, uh, um, the president of the teachers' union um, stated her objections at the time. I don't know if they were satisfied during the conversation with you subsequently. I have no way of knowing, right. but I we I, I think their job. They have a job too, we, as just as we have a job, and that is to. I, to make the effort to express to us their concerns about this as a process. Um, uh, President Hatch did. <coughs> and I think to some degree, they, uh, I don't think his concerns have been satisfied, but I think they've been addressed in some level, at least to the point where I'll, I'll feel a little more comfortable in this. But the fact that, uh, first of all, I'm, I'm, I'm honored that we actually have a council that will debate this. We'll debate this with uh, considerable passion and emotion invested in it and for the right reasons, and that is to protect the rights of workers, which is we declare in proclamations that really have no standing for the most part over and over and over again, and this is where we actually have to where it manifests, where we actually have a point where we, we get to actually put that into effect. At the same time, I'm saying I'm voting yes. I, I appreciate the, uh, the dichotomy. But the fact is here that I, I think I don't think it's asking too much. And I'm sus I suspect that I will hear from the union's PDQ after the fact on this vote, depending how it breaks. But I, th you know, a letter, um, a phone call coming speaking for the public session. This is not a secret meeting. This is, and, and they've been apprised way in advance, even by statute. And I think all efforts to reach out to the bargaining units have been made not only in spirit but have even gone beyond the spirit of the, of the law and i think in in that situation i'm feel it, it it makes it a little easier for me to vote for this because um we to, to council freeman daniel's point it, it, we there is a, ultimately for me at this point to vote no in this case would actually make me feel as if in the absence of an objection make me feel like I'm not making a responsible decision. Councilor Murphy. We're going to roll call this, correct? Yes. That's correct. Please. Okay. Uh, any other comments, Councilor Tacey? 
to move the question. Okay, great. Right. Um, all those then in favor, I'll ask the clerk to call the rolls. All those in favor on second reading say aye. Those aye. Ayes. Uh, no, 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 no. Yeah, so I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Yeah. All right. <laughs> no, respectfully. White? Yes, respectfully. Councilor Freeman Daniel? Aye. Councilor Lagarde? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor Spector? Aye. Councilor Schwartz? No. Councilor Tacey? Yes. Councilor Adams? No. Okay, so the measure is adopted uh, by a vote of six to three. Um, and uh, we'll now move on to the rest of the agenda. Six to three.